I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. Patrick Dixon. Patrick, thank you so much for being with us. Here's where we check that your mic and your screen are working. It seems to be working. How are you, sir? Yeah, really, really pleased to be participating today. This is really, really important. You know, things which are useful, things which are interesting, and there are things which are literally a matters of life and death. And this is literally a matter of life and death. And I say that, Ross, as a physician, um, and, uh, um, you know, you, you and I go back a long way. Uh, my medical practice, I, I was a hospice doctor working in London, looking after people dying at home. And my own medical practice was hijacked by a new mutant virus, which hit me from nowhere. This virus completely uh, overwhelmed my, my medical work as a 30 year old doctor in London. And that virus turned out to be HIV. It's has since killed 34 million people across the world. And Russ, I'm sad to say that uh, three generations on, 30 years on, we still don't have a vaccine and we still don't have a cure. We have drugs to help people live. And I thank God for that. I thank God for the Ministry of Asset, which we, we've been involved in fighting the spread of HIV in countries like Nigeria, uh, uh, Congo, Zimbabwe, uh, Uganda, Thailand, India, all over the world are us doing what we can to teach people how to avoid HIV and to care for those affected and help people to access treatment for AIDS. But Russ, I'm seeing the same again. We saw great fears back then. We saw all kinds of misinformation. We've seen people not wanting to access antiviral treatment for AIDS, for instance, even though it saves lives. Um, and now I'm seeing the same and it breaks my heart with, with, with COVID. I, I, I just can't get my head around this emergency. The fact is, you know, we, we're talking and praying about hope. Thank God we've got it. We've got hope. Here is hope. We actually have a vaccine, an extraordinary piece of of different technologies which are working. But you know what, in Leicester, we did a, a survey recently in the NHS and we found that only seven out of 10 white people were taking the virus. Only six out of 10 Asian people were taking the virus and only four out of 10 black people, people who I would identify as black or Afro-Caribbean were taking the virus. This is really serious. And unfortunately, you know, I I'm excited that if you look at the people who worship in churches, say in London, uh, and a normal Sunday before COVID, over half uh, are from black majority churches. Extraordinary vitality. Just thank God for what he's doing, for lives changed, for churches planted, for home networks revolutionized, for communities transformed, for uh, all these amazing things. But shocking when I'm talking at supporting uh, leaders of black majority churches, I am hearing pain. I'm hearing that uh, maybe half of those congregations are worried about the virus, so worried that they won't go uh, to get it. I was talking just this morning to a doctor, a very old friend of mine who is working day and night to get the vaccine. And you know, he's been saying, I live in a multicultural, multi-ethnic borough, but I'm hardly seeing anybody come who isn't white. This is a this is really urgent. And so I, I plead with you, if you are, um, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your theology, whatever, I would say, uh, please, please consider this very carefully. And you know what? I remember conspiracy theories with HIV. People thought that it, you know, it was made in a laboratory to kill humankind or the antivirals was some plot by an Americans to kill off people in Africa and all kinds of things. I understand these things. We must tackle the worries properly. But I can say, I can assure you that I have done. And Ross, perhaps I've got time quickly to run through four worries I'm hearing. Four. Great, yeah, please do. So, Good. First, and they're really, really, really important worries, and they're inside your own church, probably. I don't care what kind of church or background you're in, you'll find them somewhere. First is safety. They say, people say, we've never seen a vaccine produced this fast. That's absolutely right. We never have. Russ, the fastest we've ever developed a vaccine anywhere in the world to anything is four years. It's a miracle what we've managed to do. And we've done it through extraordinary innovation, not through being um, uh, unsafe, but just finding ways to do things faster. You know, we, we, you know, word processors come, it enabled us to write books more quickly. I mean, things happen, technology works, thank God for it. So it's safe, I'm sure it's safe. I will have it the moment I'm offered it. Secondly, um, some have said, mRNA. I'm not sure I understand the full gene genetic thing, but it doesn't sound too nice that someone is programming my cells to make little bits of viruses. Look, if I can just show you uh, something from, from, from a fruit bowl here. Uh, I wasn't planning this, but look, this will help. 
think of the think of the virus as an apple okay we're not teaching your body to make viruses what we found is that kind of a little bit on the outside of the virus it's this thing here it's the it's the bit that the apple uses to pull itself onto the tree this is this is characteristic of an apple in fact we can recognize the apple from this we don't need this so what if we could train some of your cells to make these little bits hundreds of billions of them totally harmless it's not going to fill in with viruses but just these little bits that might train your body to be ready so that when you see an apple, you think, absolutely, I know what that is. That's what we're doing. So with mRNA, we're teaching some of the cells in your body to make the tiniest, tiniest little thing. It's, I think it's absolutely ingenious. When God made us, we were told in Genesis chapter one to go forth and subdue the earth. And I, I, I feel it's part of us subduing COVID, for goodness sake. We're using the creative creative genius of heaven itself the god-given intellect and we are made in the image of god as creative creatures to solve problems and we have the genius to do it we've done it we found a way of making these tiny little bits let's make as many as we can okay the third issue is some have said i'm worried I've heard that Microsoft or some other person might be manufacturing chips and popping them into the glass ampules. And if that gets inside my body, bros, it will get into my brain and someone will control me forever. Listen, I tell you this, this is a wonderful dream if you're a dictator. <laughs> I tell you, there are people all over the world that would give billions of dollars of such technology. I think Donald Trump would, might have liked it to win the last election. <laughs> okay. President Putin might like it too right now. But you know what? It's I can tell you as a physician, it's really, really difficult to get a chip working inside the brain. 50,000 people in the world have them. Sadly, they are people who have had major accidents, Ross. They can't, uh, they can't control their bodies, but with a chip in place, maybe they can turn the TV from ITV to BBC. Maybe they can turn up the temperature by thinking about it. Maybe they can control a robotic arm a little bit. I thank God for that technology, but it's crude, expensive. It requires hours of neurosurgical time in the best uh, operating theaters in the world. I tell you, you can't do it by just popping a chip in a piece of vaccine, in a vaccine bottle. And we'd see them anyway, <laughs> because each ampule is, is, is checked for purity and, 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 and expected. So the final one, and I think this is a more serious one, a more serious one, and I think we should be very thoughtful about this, is that some of the vaccine types, and there's one of them in particular, the o Oxford AstraZeneca one, uh, involves a growing dead viruses, inactivated viruses, viruses that can do nothing. This is the equivalent of growing one of these, but it's got no, no pips inside it, okay? It can't do anything, can't reproduce. You can plant this apple, but it's got no pips, it won't grow. So it's a, a bit like making deactivated viruses, viruses that cannot program cells. They can't do anything, but it is pretty much a whole, whole virus. It, it, it's not just like growing a little bit. Well, these viruses have been grown in vats, like um, growing yeast, you know, to, to brew beer. Okay, you, you, you add various ingredients and, and the viruses grow. Well, you can't grow viruses. Viruses basically are just um, like biotech machines. They grow inside cells. And so they were using human cells to grow the viruses, okay? The viruses are being grown inside human cells. And the truth is that the human cells that are being used were originally about 25 to 30 years ago extracted from one particular fetus that was, uh, was removed for uh, legitimate reasons, uh, but nevertheless, those cells came from a fetus. Now, that does present for many people a profound theological question about life, about ethics, and so on. Um, and, uh, and, and many people have looked at the science and considered this very carefully. One of the, I mean, I have been lecturing on bioethics, the ethics of, of, of complex issues. You know, often in life, we have a, an evil, something which we do not want to see happen. And we have another evil, which is even greater and even more horrific, which we also want to prevent. And sometimes we have a choice between two. The Catholic uh, community has, uh, has, has uh, led the way in, in all kinds of ethical questions because of their passionate uh, theology and commitment to the life of the unborn. Yeah? And uh, what, is, what is important to know is that 
Catholic theologians, too, along with Christian theologians of just about every persuasion, having looked, and, and with the full backing of the Pope, having looked at all the love and respect that we have for the unborn, having looked at all the unease that there would be about the way in which their cells were obtained, had concluded that since no further travesty would be committed, no further offense against human nature would be committed by using their cells, and that not doing so might result in the cataclysmic number of deaths that uneasy though it may feel, we should nevertheless work with that particular vaccine. Now, the reason why it's important, I spend a lot of my time working in the poorest parts of the world, supporting the work of asset with AIDS. You can't afford to use many of these other vaccines. These other vaccines are coming out at 30 pounds a pop. The, the, the one that we're talking about where you, you create the you know, damaged virus particles, these are about three pounds a shot. And what's more, you can put them in an ordinary fridge and store them so that you can give them in, in Congo. You can use them in, in, in Zimbabwe or remote rural Uganda. There's no hope for a country to have to keep a vaccine at minus 80 degrees centigrade. That's two or three times colder than your own freezer in your own house. To have that kind of cold chain from the moment of manufacture across the whole world into the deepest bush is just a nightmare. So let's be very careful, I would say, before dismissing technology on that single fact. So overall, I'm saying this, I don't care what vaccine I get offered, I will grab it with all my heart the moment it is offered to me. And my hope and prayer is that we will see wide access, wide take up, that all those who are offered it will take it in the UK, especially those of faith who have been worried for spiritual reasons, which is why this program is so important. But I pray too for an end of COVID and I pray that access will be good across the entire world for the poorest of the poor as well. Sorry, that's the end of me. Brilliant. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't get anyone more passionate than Patrick, but he was, <laughs> he was the best we could. No, Patrick, thank you so much. You are a, you are a global authority on these things, I, for which reason I feel slightly sorry about just, I think when Patrick was talking about numbers out of 10 for taking the virus, he meant taking the vaccine, just to clarify, I think. I'm so sorry if I slipped there. No, so just, just want to correct. make sure people have got that. We're going to go to some... Yeah, the numbers. We're going to go to some Q and A, and uh, please send in some questions. We have a number of questions. Uh, well, Patrick, I'm coming to you with this one actually, because Carol is asking you um, a main concern for herself and her friends is actually about this issue of the second injection. So she was keen to get the first injection and all of her paperwork, you know, uh, says that the, um, the, the, the first injection, the second injection should be delivered after 21 days. That's what the Pfizer paperwork says because she's had the Pfizer vaccine, the expensive one, as you mentioned. Um, but the government is saying it's gonna be 12 weeks. I know my dad, you know, we went on whatever it was on, on, on January the 28th, we're not back till April the 28th. So tell us, should we be worried about the fact that some of us who have had the vaccine are going to be waiting longer for that second jab okay well the first thing is we have to say we don't know we don't know i, I don't know um you know do you know what it'll take us a year to work out whether the vaccine we're giving lasts a year it will take two years from now to know if the vaccine protects people for two years and it'll take 10 years to know and take until the year 2031 to know what the longer term protection is of this particular vaccine. We do not know. And what we do know are basic things we know from other vaccines. So we know that and we can see an initial great big response. The good news is that all of these vaccines are producing a really big jump in immune protection with the very first dose. Isn't that wonderful? So of course the logic is to get that first emergency dose. And we are in a national emergency. This is like a wartime mobilization. First dose to as many possible people as we can. And then we'll go back and top up as many as we can. And of course you want to do it within a reasonable period. But uh, as a research that seems to suggest that actually if you give the body a little bit of time to really work out what they've just been slugged by. <laughs> what was that? Oh, okay, I better make some antibodies for that. And then I shall settle down and, and get on with the rest of my life. And then suddenly it hit again. Right, that's really serious. You got my attention now. I'm certainly going to get going on that. To, but to hit the body twice, you know, within a week and a half, it's almost the same reaction. To hit it twice within, say, a two weeks, three weeks, and the body's thinking, 
yeah, it's probably just a bit of a virus lingering around. I don't need to worry too much. I knocked that one out last time. But when it comes back fresh and the body, the body's thinking, I dealt with you a long time ago. It's about time I kicked you out of my life forever. That's what we want. We want an immune system that is effective and double prime. So that's the reason why many scientists think it's a jolly good idea to give a bit of extra time but we won't know the full answers yet. <laughs> Let me tell you how complicated it is. You might find that actually the right length of time in 18 year olds is two and a half weeks. The best time if you're 35 years old is 4.5 weeks. The best time if you're over 80 weeks is two weeks apart. <laughs> it's just so complicated, Russ. We just have to go with the flow. The point is this, if I, if I was anywhere near the vaccination program at the moment, I would be doing exactly the same. I'd say, get the the first emergency dose out as fast as our legs can carry us to our entire population and, and, and then go back with a second dose to all the vulnerable people as quickly as we possibly can. I just thank God we're doing it. It's okay. astonishing when we look back at what's been achieved. Patrick, that is great. 